VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Welcome back to my podcast, VIP Access. This podcast spotlights established as well as upcoming artists, and I'm very happy to be coming to the final episode of this season. And you know what they say about saving the best for last? Hey, Kasiva is here. <laughs> Pepe, pepe. Yo, karibu sana Kasiba. Thank you, Anyeko. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, mm-hmm. look at that attire. Terere. Look at that hairpin, which actually is your sticks for playing your drums. Cues Wakanda forever. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Just looking at you, I can tell that you have something... Um, and a connection to drums. Um, just, a, just a minute, before you say anything, mm-hmm. I just want to paint a picture to who Kasiva is. For those who are listening, watching, you know, I read your bio and it rightfully stated that you're one of the leading um, f- and female um, percussionists, but I have to correct that bio right now. Mm-hmm. She is one of Africa's <laughs> leading percussionist <laughs> period. Not even females, but bring me the best West African male percussionist here right now. Utaona showdown and she's going to win. This Thanks. chick <laughs> is actually one of Africa's best of the best. And That's it's such an too. honor for me that you come from my country, you know, that I know you and that you continue to expand your art and craft day in, day out. You know, we started knowing you as a percussionist, but then you've morphed into this artist who's also giving us different forms of art, you know, music, you're a singer. So in your own words, who is Kasiva? Ooh, Kasiva is very many things. Mm. I'd like to describe myself as an African woman, a drummer, an art entrepreneur. Um, I am a speaker and I'm also a teacher because life has just lifed and it's morphed to become or to realize, to make me realize that I have to teach or I have to empower Mm. as I keep going. So there's a part of me that is fully dedicated to empowering young women and Mm. um, actually men and women alike. And um, this is done through speaking and teaching um, these forms of art that I carry within myself. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Let me tell you um, on this podcast, on episode, I think episode four, Mm -hmm. I interviewed a singer from um, South Africa. Actually, she's originally from Lesotho. She's called Leomile. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know her, but you should go and check her out. What? The vibe she gave me, the energy she gave me is the vibe and energy you're giving me. Like Amazing. when you're speaking, when I look at you, you know, when I look up, when I look through, you know, back to your journey, I kind of feel like you carry along a lot of history, you know, and lessons and wisdom way and you know that surpass your own experience and that's true and even age tell me about that because it's just a vibe i'm feeling (laughs) well um you're not the first person to say this and sometimes i look within i try to look inside myself and figure what is what is this wisdom people are saying when i'm old (laughs) Because they 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 see you, yeah, and they see some things you might not necessarily see for yourself. Absolutely, but they also feel things, and I think just first to embody um, or carry a drum within myself is is a whole story, and I think the drum as an instrument is a vessel that speaks about a lot. It's one instrument that joins or you can see through generations it's an instrument that communicates it's an instrument that evokes and i think being a bearer of that or being a person who operates that or being a person who plays drums and embodies drums the way i do then i carry all those aspects within myself um when you look at our history or our tradition drums were used in spaces where storytelling was happening. And we tell our history through stories. Africans or the African continent is known to document our history through storytelling from generation to generation so that we're gonna get a certain you know, fable or story by clicking on a link. This is something that um, is passed down from the older to the younger. And it's also like um, as, as, as the same as passing skill 
it's it's something that you had to sit with your mentor or sit with the older guy and learn to do and there is no other way to learn some things that are in our african traditions other than being empowered and other than having to sit with your mentor so having and when you look at as going back to say when you look at spaces that we have in the in the african community or in our traditions drums were very present there was always drums in storytelling there were drums in um, rites of passage there were drums in uh, ceremonies mm -hmm. there were drums in and when i say ceremonies i mean like um, all sorts of ceremonies weddings um circumcision ceremonies um when a child is born and you would always find drums in these spaces so i carry these stories or embody these feelings or evoke these images in your mind when i sit in a space and i think that is why then people feel what they feel because somehow someone just looking at kasiva or listening to her play or um or just listening to her music um in whichever form live or recorded you get nostalgic at some point or these memories or these these sites or these spaces are evoked in you and you start remembering and sort of even connect deeper with who you are mm. as an african because this one tool is a very very important tool and i'll be talking about it more wow yeah. wow 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 i mean that makes so much sense it does for sure yeah that makes so much sense mm. I mean, drums were used just for communication, period. Mm -hmm. When there was, you know, danger somewhere, there's mm -hmm. a specific drum sound that would people would hear and know that's what this means. That's true. So, and even that's why some drums are called talking drums. Mm -hmm. there's, essentially, yeah. all drums are talking anyway. Well, I mean, yeah, most, I... Well, my connection with drums is a bit deeper. So when I start talking about drums, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a love <laughs> it's a love relationship. But yes, I do believe that um, all drums talk, even though there is a specific drum That's called a talking I, drum I was thinking. from West Africa. But all drums talk. All drums speak depending on the tone because most uh, many drums have different tones. Mm. There's a bass tone, there's a soprano tone, there's um, a harsh tone, there's a slap tone. Mm. Um, and they'll evoke different feelings within someone depending on what is played, how it is played, the speed that it is played, and even the touch that you give it. For instance, I have to say that um, in very many spaces, people tend to connect with my drumming because it's, you can say, effeminate. It has a feminine energy channeling through. It necessarily does not mean that I am a weaker player or that I am not as good as the other person. It's just that I believe that when you handle an instrument, it channels the energy that you carry or the spirit that you carry. And the fact that I exist as a woman, that is what I channel through my drums. Mm -hmm. And you can feel the sensitivity, the wholeness, what we carry, um, the caring factor of being a woman, um, being a nurturer, you can feel all that when I hold a drum. Wow. Kasiva. Samer. This is so deep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I knew we were going to talk about like percussions and drums, but I didn't know how deep in love you are with the drums. <laughs> so how many drums do you have or how do you pick which one do I go with on tour? Yeah. Because also they're a bit cumbersome. I mean, how many drums could you carry? Well, it's... I have very many drums. Let's start from there. And when I just don't want to talk about drums, I want to talk about percussion as a whole because that is who I am. I yes, am a percussionist. Yes. And you have various other instruments. That exactly. You, I've seen you play and exactly. it's almost like a multitasking of mm -hmm, sorts. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And when I talk about, when I talk about percussion, for everyone who's listening or watching, a percussion instrument is an instrument that you can shake you can rattle or you can beat to produce a sound. So then we're talking about cups. We're talking about a drum drum. We're talking about a kayamba, a tambourine. We're talking about a shaker. a shaker. We're talking about your thighs, like literally like, you know, yeah. anything that you can beat to produce, produce a sound, sound. You're, you're, you have percussion right there. 
And when I'm teaching, I tell people, if you can hit something and it can produce a sound, then there's a, at least there's a 1% chance that you can become a percussionist. <laughs> that said, I have a lot of percussion instruments. A lot. Some I make on the go. Sometimes I get into a space and I don't get, sometimes I don't have an instrument per se, but I make things work mm. around me because, as I said, if you hit it, it can produce a sound, then, well, it can be an instrument. Um, depending on the type of music, depending on where I'm going, mm. there's so many factors that contribute to what I carry. But I have a standard, sort of like a standard setup that I have. And there's a suitcase that is full of, people call it paraphernalia, <laughs> that I walk around with. So this suitcase has a lot of the, the soft percussion instruments. Mm. I mean, the shakers, the tambourines, whatnot. And then there's the drums. And the drums um, are determined by the kind of music, also where I'm going, because sometimes you might, be, you might need eight drums. And getting eight drums on a plane is not easy. So then you have to either sh um, shrink the setup to like three or four, or it also depends on what kind of music you're going to play. For instance, if I'm going to collaborate with, say, like, uh, you know, South Americans, I definitely would not carry conga congas because I know there's a lot of congas in South America. And if that's where I'm going, then I'll totally bring something fresh, something different that they've never seen mm. so that we can also play around with textures and see what happens. There's spaces where you're requested to come as Kenyan as Kenyan can be. Yes. That means then you have to bring the traditional drums that we have uh, from the country and so on and so forth. It, it just doesn't end. You just have to, you figure as you go, yeah. you reinvent as you go. Yeah. Mm. And I think you mentioned somewhere that um, your, you know, first relationship with the drums was inspired by folk tales that were told by your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Um, who was your grandmother and how long ago was, were these early inspirations, you know, that, you know, made you who you are? Um, my grandmother, uh, my God rest her soul in peace. Her name was Kasiva. Oh my yes. God. I'm she, talking to Kasiva. <laughs> she is the, or the, the OG, original, the, the OG, OG Kasiva. Yeah. And, um, she, I mean, as most of our grandparents, we would sit together and she would tell me all these, you know, stories, folk tales when I was a kiddo. And we do this by the fire, mostly in the evenings. And that was a very special time for me because I feel like that's where I learned how to be a keen listener, but also be able to um, get the relationship between rhythm and the environment. Mm. Um she would tell me all these stories and I was, I really, really loved these folk tales. They're super interesting. And you know, as you know, that these um, stories always have a lesson at the end. Yes. So you're always waiting to see, okay, what is the lesson? Yeah. You know, what, what, are, what are we learning today? And I'd want so many lessons because it's always a trip to get to understand. It's almost, it's almost gratifying getting to the end and knowing, ah, this is what I'm learning today. Natella Shosh, tell me another story, tell me another one. And she'd get tired because she was old. Mm. So she kind of devised a way to keep me at bay and like just <laughs> like kind of get like some breathing time. Yeah. And she'd be, you know, tell me, telling me something and then all of a sudden go like, Kasiva, do you hear that? I'm like, what? You don't hear that? I go run to the cow pen and listen to what's happening, Oko. So I can be there. I go, I try and listen, I'm like, nothing's happening. Come back and say, nothing's happening. She's like, no, 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 go listen carefully. That white cow is telling the black goat a certain secret. I'm like how? I'm like, go back and listen. So I go listen, I listen, I don't hear anything. She's like, take your time, listen deeper. So I go back and I try listening even more keenly. Mm -hmm. And then I started hearing sounds. I would hear, you know, the, I would literally hear the animals breathing. Mm. Um, crickets, you know, the wind howling in the trees. If there's um, kidogo rain coming, you hear it, you know, pattering on the ground or on the iron sheets. And all through this, these sounds in, I would say, indefinite time, I started hearing rhythm. And when I'd go to bed at night, these sounds would, they would almost haunt me in the way that they were dancing within each other. And I tried to replicate what I was hearing or what I was feeling 
on my chest, on my laps, you know, and just that's how I started making rhythm. Because if you sit still and observe, there's so much happening around True. us. True. And not even to mention that we are in a city that is just bustling with so many sounds and so many textures. And the creativity then hence never ends because all these all these sounds are happening and time is indefinite, as I said. So there's always something to hear. There's always a rhythm happening. It just never ends. So until now, that's how I still make my rhythms. They are majorly inspired by sounds around me. Wow. Mm. I really love that. I really love that because, you know, what someone else could perceive as noise or a disturbance, mm-hmm. you know, could be music to it, your ears or to somebody is, else's yeah, ear. It is music to a certain degree. Yeah. I mean, just because sound is texture and texture is feeling if you look at it in the long run. Mm. Because a certain sound, there's a, a frequency of a sound that makes you feel like you just want to scream. And there is a sound that is calming. Mm. Or I call these textures because just as textures that you can touch or colors that you can see, they evoke a certain feeling. True. Like this seat makes me feel happy because it has such a, this, you know, this color is bright. The texture of the material on this seat is, it's kind of coarse and it gives me a certain feeling. Mm. That's why when you enter a certain space, you can say, A, this space looks African. Yes. Because of the colors, Mm. because of the prints, because of the textures that are going on there. That's why you can say this space looks bohemian because of certain textures. Just like that in music, certain sounds trigger certain feelings, certain emotions. And I think that's how... Maybe you're able to tell rockers are rockers because there's a certain aggressiveness that the instruments give Mm. as opposed to um, chora music, which the chora gives certain tones by by the plucking of the strings, certain tones, and it evokes a certain feeling of calm and relaxed and, you know, and so on. It just doesn't end. Yo, 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 yo. Tukoshule. My goodness. I feel like we should have a podcast just for t- me- sounds and textures and drums only a whole it. season. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's so much fun. It is so much fun. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you've been part of a, a, a lot of, you know, projects like Coke Studio Africa and even, um, you know, tours and travel and opportunities that have had have given you the experience to play with various artists from all over Africa, from around the world. Um, how has that experience been? I feel like a lot of other artists, and especially those who are on this podcast, they actually play with other instrumentalists or they have like a, a, a band that they play with. But you're very unique in the sense that you're that one artist who probably play could play with anyone and everyone, but at the same time, would also just do your thing. So what's that kind of experience, you know, being being an artist who is able or in a space that, you know, you know, puts you at a place where you have to collaborate with various individuals, is that something that um, comes to you comfortably or how is that experience? Well, um, first I have to say that I I am very humbled that I am able to travel so much and also have the opportunity to collaborate with as many artists as I have and take part in collaborative projects. They are very, very special to me, these collaborative projects, because they really open up the scope in which you see music or in the way that you take in music. Before I started traveling or before I started working with other artists, I can say that my mind was narrowed down to only what I knew, and that is what was readily available to me in Mm. Kenya. So I knew the instruments that are here, and I'm quite conversant with the cultures that we have here. But then I realized that there's so much that is just outside what you know, and you have to be very welcoming in the sense of you have to learn to unlearn to be able to receive what other people bring. When you hear Egyptian music, for example, is when you start realizing that you don't know, you just, you just, you you don't know. And it it just, the 
the magnitude continues as you as, as you travel further as you deal with indigenous communities in like all sorts of places in the world and you realize there's so much to there's so much to music than what we only know or what we dare to understand so for me uh collaborative spaces are really a school for me they're a learning institution because i'm always entering there or going to these spaces with a very open heart to just receive and not necessarily to even impose what i know or mm. give what i know but really to take in and realize how do these people relate to the music but also what is the music telling you where are these people from what kind of issues do they face from day to day um how do they relate with their environment because just looking at an instrument tells you it's a whole story what the instrument is made of tells you this person is from a tropical climate um the tones that the the instrument gives you can generally give you a feel of where these people are from in the way that they sing the scales are they sad scales are they happy scales you can be able to tell the maybe this person is from a very very cold country and it's they have very harsh winters and you're able to tell from how they sing um or you just you can just generally tell from their music so collaborative spaces are very um interesting spaces for me because i get to understand people and also partake or even travel to other places that i haven't been to like for instance if the residency is in the states for instance and i'm meeting somebody from cambodia i'm able to virtually go to cambodia through the spirit of this person and what they have to offer um it's also just it so the interesting thing is it gets on a level where so you get to receive what this person is giving you but you also get to play around with what if i fuse my culture with their culture it's literally like having a biracial child yeah. and realizing what is this person going to become mm. and you get so you get to understand um how to play around with scales how to play around with rhythms if in musical time we have like 4/4 four, like a beat is in 4/4 four, four, like that's like 4/4 four, four. so you you have your 4/4 four, four from where you come from yeah. and they have their 4/4 four, four. so you're like okay let's fuse these 4/4s four, yes. and see what they give us so it's always an interesting opportunity to see what are we going to birth from this collaboration um collaboration sometimes refuse to work because you don't know um sometimes you you meet instruments and you don't know these instruments or you're not familiar with how they function mm. for instance there's instruments that are tuned very differently from how we tune our instruments and i feel like these processes also help me to develop even more empathy as a human being because you look at your instrument and you look at the other person's instrument and zimekata kuskizana they are just <laughs> they're just they're just not understanding yeah. each other and so you have either to detune your instrument to be able to understand this other instrument or they have to come to your level so it's almost like a playing field and i feel like it it really teaches me so many things other like away from the music just as a human being mm. how to survive how to live with people how to communicate if if people are in a fight i remember i had to detune my instrument for it to reach a certain level so mm. i feel like okay i'll come down so that we are able to understand each other it's I, collaborative spaces are life itself they are really spaces that um define existence mm. within itself because just before the music you really have to be basic human beings mm. and understand each other on a certain level before you even dive into the music and that makes me think of you know the guitar or whichever instrument and what tuning does to an instrument mm-hmm. you already have the instrument but it's like not at its best so you're kind of tuning it to you know make it better make it sound better and i feel like that's also what like we can do every day as individuals you know to keep learning to keep tuning ourselves to keep teaching ourselves things that can make us better so That's i so see true. yeah where how you're correlating you know the musical experience and the instrument experience to the 
day in day like day in, human experience. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> There's a certain um I was in a certain project called the Nile Project. Mm. And the Nile Project brings together a group of uh, musicians from all the countries along the Nile basin. And we came with all our traditional instruments and I could see really like this played out it it played out in front of me so hard and I was just like man if this is what we have to do to cope as human beings then let's do it. There's um there's an instrumentalist from Uganda. He had like a big marimba and um, the instrumentalist from Egypt had, I think, a flute. And you know, in Egypt or in Egyptian music, they have these half tones and quarter notes and half notes and quarter notes. I don't notes. know. I don't know. I'm just learning. <laughs> oh, well, they have half notes and quarter notes in their music. And we don't have that in East Africa because we basically use something we call a pentatonic scale. Mm. Do, re, mi, so, yes. la. You know? And for this flute, which is called a kawala, for the kawala to understand or to be able to play together with the marimba, one had to give. And it was the marimba which had to give because you cannot, there's no other way, the, 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 the flute is already tuned. It mm. is an instrument and you cannot, you cannot detune the flute mm. because it already has, it's been tuned, it's been made to play those quarter notes and half notes. So what did the Ugandan do? He took a machete and hacked into the pieces of wood that make, into the, the, make the marimba and hacked very carefully until he found the quarter notes. And I thought, man, I mean, this, so he, oh, for sure he travels with like different planks of wood. <laughs> so he tuned like, he tuned wow. the others to like the pentatonic scale. But whenever we had to play this particular song, he would swap up and place the newly created planks of wood that could play the half notes and the quarter notes. And I thought, this is, isn't this just beautiful? Eh. Isn't this just beautiful? There is a science to the, the <laughs> percussions. You know, we don't talk enough about the science of percussion. There's a know. science. There's a science to music, as a whole. Yeah. And I, yeah. It's, and it's deeper even than the books. No, no, it really, it is. And I mean, I'll just say we're not just ready to have that conversation because it's a lot. It's a lot. And and when I challenge people to get out of their minds or get out of their comfort zones and experience what other people have to bring mm. is exact is this is it's exactly what I mean. Challenge yourself to listen to music from Chad, from Liberia, mm. from Sierra Leone. Get to understand what are these how are these people living? Mm. What are their tones? How do their instruments look like? Go on YouTube and say, today I just want to look or watch music from Gambia. Mm. You know? And and other than Sona Jobate, who yeah. we all know, let's discover other people who are who are the vijanas of Gambia. Yes. What are their social problems? What are they practicing activism through their music? And mm. if they are, how? What are the what are the issues that they are facing? Mm. What are they um, what are they addressing in their music? Um, in the changing times, how are they um, fusing pop? and their traditional music. What is their traditional music? What are their stories? Mm. This is the only way that Africa as a continent is going to go further and we'll be able to actually um, articulate our stories in the way that we want to articulate them because we actually understand each other on that level. Mm. You're speaking the gospel of, of, of my life, my, you know, my work, my this podcast. I just feel like we are still not discovering each other as much as we should. Word. And I still feel like a lot of the music fans or just everyone has a lot of work to do because every industry always has its issues. If you go to Southern Africa, to Western Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, every country you know, has a complaint here and there. And I feel like we all have a role to play, but then everyone has to ask themselves, what's my role to play? And I feel like the people who listen who listen to the music, the entire society, any listener, there's no one who doesn't listen to music. We can say maybe different people have different preferences, different type of sounds, but whether you're 100 years old or five years old, there's some music you know that you listen to or mm -hmm. that is exposed to you. I think we have so much work to do in discovering more of our own artists and the artists of other regions. And the 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 moment each artist will, you know, put that upon themselves the way you put it upon yourself. They'll start to see more growth. They'll start to see them themselves, you know, 
expanding mm-hmm. beyond the knowledge that they already had, exactly yeah. what you talked about. Mm. And that's what's going to move this content f- continent forward. And I also think like it's a different way of telling African stories. I think people always think telling African stories is talking or shooting a documentary or doing a film mm-hmm. or writing a film, but it's all these different things. It's all these different things. You know? I mean, yeah, documenting or just us being able to express ourselves takes different forms. It takes different shapes from film to documentaries, as you said, to um, cartoons, to physical storytelling, like literally just like my grandma sitting around the fire with, with kids, um, to music, to teaching the the coming generation, Gen Z, how to play Nyatitis, how to play Orutu, how to, um, you know, just embodying what we truly are. This is the only way we're going to, you know, mm. tell our stories as the way they're supposed to be told. Yeah. 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 And, and give our narrative in the way that it's supposed to be given. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about your music, mm-hmm. your album, your EP. <laughs> so Let's tell us about, about that. You know, we haven't even gotten into the music itself. You mm. know, you can search um, Kasiva Mutua anywhere. She has her own EP, album, and many collaborations with other artists. So let's get into your debut EP. It's called Ngewa. Ngewa. Yes. But there's a song, Haku? Hakukole. Hakukole. Uh-huh. Which language? is that well hakukole is a term that um is it is in south america mm. that um, that defines a style of teaching okay in idioms and synonyms that actually makes fun of people but at the end has a teaching just like our oh, stories wow. as, as i said that you wow. know we, we used to learn from stories that finally give you a teaching. Mm. So hakukole is a form of art that kind of ridicules and makes fun of people. But at the end, there's a story to be learned. And I thought, why not hakukole this stuff? Why not hakukole this stuff? So this track is about, um, makes fun of somebody who went abroad and then came back and came back with this wang. And this person asks them, how long has it taken you to go to the States or wherever and mm. came back with a certain accent? Um, we are Africans. This is this is how you were speaking before you left. Nakukole, you Makes a it. whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that you shouldn't just adapt something as fast as you are adapting it and forget really who you are mm. because where you come from is actually quite precious. Yeah. yeah. What is the meaning of Ngewa? Ngewa is uh, a Kamba name for stories. And the EP is a storytelling journey. It's very short. It's only 15 minutes. But the 15 minutes are um, the stories of where I have been, the stories of people that I have interacted with. Clearly your inspiration. <laughs> you know? and, and some of my personal stories. And some things Ngawa. you learned. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Even Hakukole, you're like and, perfect. And Hakukole, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's a culmination of stories told in rhythm mm. and told in different textures and different um, expressions yeah. that really document where I've been, who I've spoken to, some of my experiences and... Even my wildest imaginations, because my imagination is me. So it's it's a lot of growth to say, because um, people have always known me as a drummer, as a percussionist. And now I have uh, become a singer and I picked up a new instrument during the pandemic, the guitar, and started expressing bits of myself that I felt only a melodic instrument could bring out. So this is... It's it's Kasiva. It's still Kasiva, but Kasiva morphing into Kasiva Pro Max. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's me learning to express myself in different languages mm. now. Not just the drum, but picking up more instruments yeah. and also learning how to poke those parts of me that have still not been heard to see 
what instrument or what textures or what sounds can bring out that part of Kasiva. Mm. So this is a new experience and um, hope people are enjoying this new Kasiva. We are. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so When much. When I think of the Kasiva I met at Coke Studio, it's definitely not that Kasiva. <laughs> like, you really have grown in leaps and bounds in such a short time. Like, even when your EP came out, I was like, wow, and she can sing. <laughs> and then this now, so I, I, I don't know what else, like, but in this language of, you know, music and percussions and instruments, I feel like there's just so much room for expanding or even collabs, you mm -hmm. know, so really looking forward to future releases projects. Absolutely. And I know before this interview, you mentioned that there could be an interesting electronic, um, you know, EP that you're working on with somebody. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you could just say it up for, for the people listening. Absolutely. So um, as I continue to experiment and keep on, you know, reinventing and discovering myself, um, interacting with all these musicians and meeting all these people from all over the world and there's an electronic music bug in the world right now. And I think it's biting everybody <laughs> and it's gotten to me too. <laughs> and I mean, with my love for electronic music, I also want to see how I can contribute to that space with who I am and bringing in my colors and seeing how do these colors play out with electronic music. Mm. So I'm collaborating with a producer from uh, Norway and we have an electro, I would say electro Afro, uh, album in the making it's an album so that is in the works in the works it's in the tunnels it's coming it's gonna be fresh super interesting boppy that's amazing yeah you'll do that to this proper. yeah yeah and the, uh, on the same note please listen to unganisha music they're really cool um duo band and labdi who's from kenya he's from norway and it's a good fusion of electronic music and, absolutely you know traditional ele african and instruments and yeah. elements and kenyan instruments as mm -hmm. well yeah. um i'm still not done with you you're looking at me like we are, we are done. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> In fact, I'll prompt you to say more. <laughs> um, so what's your personality like mm -hmm. when you're on stage or when you're in the studio or when you're writing? Do you consider Kasiva to be the same Kasiva in all different elements, um, you know, be it on stage or in the studio or whatever? Like, do you have, you know, aliases? I definitely have a couple of aliases. But I would like to think of myself as somebody who comes alive or is prompted by the spaces or the environments that I'm in. Mm. Um, because I wholesomely believe in energy and spaces and people give you energy because people carry spirits. And so when I'm on stage, it depends on the audience mm. as well. But it also depends on the music. There's so many factors that come yeah. into play. And that affects you because um, the way I, I, I would want to believe that the way you carry yourself in Kenya is not the way you will carry yourself when, for example, you're in the States. Because when you're in the States, you're faced with the reality of actually being in a foreign land. Yes. And you feel the need to defend the Kenyan in you or that, that aspect comes out alive because mm. the relationship that people have with you is based off of that because people will tend to ask you, hey, your accent is quite cool. Where are you from? And that already has formed the basis of interaction mm. in that particular moment. So whether you choose to talk about, whatever you choose to talk about, um, what you relate to back home already has curved the conversation that you're going to have with this person, yeah. where you are. Yes. And that already affects who you are and how you will tie yeah. yourself out. So in on stage, coming back to music on stage, um, there's so many different aspects where you are, what kind of gig you're playing. A concert, like a festival festival, brings out like a wild energy and you'll see this, probably you'll see a side of Kasiva that you've never seen. <laughs> but an intimate, you know, um, living room session yeah. also carries its own vibes. And you will tend to bring out, you know, a certain side of you or display a certain energy. But there, is, there are the fundamentals of a human being that form a human being. Mm. And I think uh, mine is, my love for percussion is, is fundamentally something that I am and it's something that I carry everywhere. Whether I walk into a boardroom or I walk into a cultural center, this 
element is always within me. Mm. Um, in studio, I am, I mean, I wouldn't say a studio is far away from a performance space. But what I have noticed about myself is that I don't like making music when a camera is in front of me. Oh. Yeah, because it's a very, I would, I tend to believe it's a very vulnerable space and I'm, I'm still learning how to operate. So how are you coping that. at Coke Studio with all the cameras and? So that is a performance. Mm. So you are performing. Yeah. But when you have, but making music, it's I, different. when I say making music, I mean like composing and writing. Uh-huh. I tend you like to not. Your- Privacy. I like my privacy okay. and um, I think that is the reason why I, I was thinking of making a documentary of the making of my album but I realized it would just suck because I just I don't like cameras when mm. I'm actually creating you know because I feel like it's kind of invasive unless I enter a room and I'm told okay there's cameras and you cannot see them do your thing but we have to hide the cameras because we want to <laughs> see what goes on behind the scenes <laughs> Hey, exactly. Someone but, bring small cameras to Casiba. Ay, ay, ay. I will just like I will just shrink. But yeah, when I'm writing, when I'm composing, when I'm, um, you know, coming up with a melody or just you know just giving that, planting a seed of the song, mm. I tend to like, uh, I tend to like, very private spaces and mostly preferably um, nature being mm. out in vast open spaces yeah wow wow mm-hmm. wow guys this is how we end the season and i'm i mean you can even see how i'm struggling to say like it's over but it's kind of over but it's not but thank you so much for just being yourself you know for telling authentic african stories kenyan stories for using all these instruments to talk to us to tell us different stories and vibes for always being super amazing and nice and approachable and you know, ready to converse. Every time I've been chasing you during your world tour, you've always been telling me I'm at rehearsals, I'm out of the country. (laughs) You know, despite all the busy schedule, you're always there to respond back and I truly appreciate. And, you know, it's just a pleasure for me to see you, you know, grow into your own self, into an artist of different, um, you know, hearts. And this is not the Kasiva I met. Um, and the rest of the years. So thank you so much. You're such an inspiration to me. You know, I like what you do with Vibes in a Queen. Mm-hmm. I like that you dedicate a, a huge element of your time, you know, to empowering women particularly. Um, and it's something I also strive to do. So big up to you, Kasiva. Big up to you, Aniko. Look <laughs> at the space that you've created for us all. Look at, look at the season. You know, yeah. and this is this is fantastic, and I have to commend you for creating a space where people can truly express themselves in a way that they want to express themselves and tell their stories in the way that they want to tell their stories, in the way that they want to be heard. So kudos to you and keep inspiring us. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really love this. Like, we spoke about drums for, like, more than 20 minutes. I'm like, why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah. Let's not talk about... High costs of living. No, let's talk about percussion. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, so everyone watching, everybody listening, please, please, please. Kasiva Mutua is everywhere. You just need to Google that name. Go on to Spotify, Apple Music, Boomplay, wherever you listen to your music or even YouTube. And please stream her music. It will always inspire you and take you back to the folk tales of our... What? Who, who are them? Wahenga, Wahenga. our ancestors. Eh? Yes, our ancestors. Word, yeah. So it's on this very wholesome note that I'm ending this season. It's a wrap for VIP Access Season 3. We'll be back with yet another season very soon. Keep it here. <laughs> oh my God, did you play the instrument? Ah. <laughs> we don't have to. We don't have no, to. No, we don't have to. We don't have to. We don't have to. But yeah. VIP Access. VIP Access. With Aniko on Africa Loud.